So welcome everybody to the um, webinar, Decision-Making in Pediatric Colorectal Surgery. Um, I have the privilege to moderate this collaboration of the um, UPSA, Children's National in Wash, Washington, and the European Journal of Pediatric Surgery reports. We are also happy to have uh, Mark Levitt. He is Chief of Division of Colorectal and Pelvic Reconstructive Surgery at the Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. And on top, we have an expert panel that you will see later and during the session of colorectal surgeons, international colorectal surgeons, um, Julia Brizigelli uh, from um, Johannesburg, um, Paula Mitri from Treviso, Alejandra Villanova from Madrid, uh, Pim Slots from Rotterdam, Carlos Reck from Vienna, and um, our, yeah, how do you say, the heart the, uh, of everything, Gaia Tamaro from the um, UPSA office. So Mark, um, it's a big honor um, to have you here, here today and that you share your knowledge and expertise in decision-making in colorectal surgery. How are you today? I'm great, Martin. It's so nice to see you and I look forward to being together again when the world returns to normal. <laughs> great. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Um, maybe Gaia, you can show the next slide. Um, you know, there's always, um, uh, every distal cholesterolgram is uh, a big challenge, especially in inexperienced colorectal surgery. So Mark, let's say you have this distal cholesterolgram of this male RM patient um, treated in the newborn period with a uh, colostomy, and um, how do you approach this um, study? So I selected this image. It's one of my favorite images because I think it gives us an opportunity to talk a lot about the management of an anorectal malformation patient, of course, relative to the surgical plan. So maybe we could get our panelists to participate. Uh, Paola, what do you think about this image? Okay, this is a lateral, lateral um, image of a distal colostrum uh, that shows uh, the whole uh, sacrum, which is what, what we want to have in the picture. And uh, there is a pinpoint at the bottom of the, uh, on the right that shows where the perineal area um, is, and that's something we want to have in the picture. And then the whole uh, column is, uh, um, is shown that is uh, uh, well distended. And then um, if we are able to see, we can recognize a thin um, projection um, anterior to the column that joins another thin structure, which is the urethra, and then a second bulbous uh, contrast uh, uh, image in front of the column, which is the uh, beginning of the, um, like the, the, the bladder. So within this image, there are all the figures that allows you to say, uh, this is a, a well done colostrogram. Yes, yeah, so that was, a, that was okay. very good, um, very clear analysis. Paula just said a lot of very, very important things in a very short amount of time. Um, so, a couple things I want to uh, look for here. First of all, you commented on the sacrum. It shows that it's a lateral image, but also I like this image because it shows me that the sacrum looks quite normal um, and it does not look very foreshortened, which I think is an important thing to note relative to the patient's pelvic development and potential future bowel control. Um, Let's, uh, let's delve into a little bit more deeply of where is the fistula and how do we determine whether it's bulbar, prostatic, or bladder neck? Okay, Julia, can you um, give some thoughts as to how you know this is bulbar, prostatic, or bladder neck? Yes, uh, sure, I can. So it is uh, basically what you have to look at is where does the fistula insert into the urethra? And a way to uh, better and easily describe it is think of it, think of the urethra as an elbow. 
So if um, so of like an arm basically. So if the fistula inserts at the elbow, you can assume it's a rectobulbar fistula. And if it inserts above the elbow, then you can assume it's a prostatic fistula in the midline. And then higher up, you can assume it's a rectal bladder neck fistula. Very good. And then the other thing I would like to um, um, comment on, maybe uh, Thomas from, us, uh, from Stockholm has joined us. Hi, Thomas. Nice to see you. Um, um, something very interesting here is how is the bladder filling? Does that have any meaning to you, whether you can get the bladder to fill or not? Yes, I, I think it has, and I, I think normally with the rectobulbar fish, you would have a filling of the, of the anterior urethra. And in this case, you have this contrast a bit about the junction between what I think is the fistula and the urethra, which means that there is contrast coming back up towards the bladder. Yeah, so your observations are quite correct, and I think it's an important thing to note. If you can fill preferentially the bladder, then the fistula is likely above the urinary sphincter. If you, if you fill the distal urethra only and not the bladder, then the fistula is below the urinary sphincter. So I think putting all of this together, Paula, Julia, and Thomas's contribution, I'm going to consider this a prostatic fistula. Um, and uh, let's talk about whether, how we're going to manage this. I think, Gaia, if you could just advance to the next uh, slide. Oh, good, perfect. So when I was at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, um, I was on the hunt for a good elbow. And this is a Rodin statue, and I thought it had a beautiful arm and elbow to use for this illustration. So this is what I saw. Next slide. I saw this. I saw a bladder superimposed onto the man and the urethra represented by the arm as uh, Julia described. And the next slide shows us the different locations of the fistula, just like Julia explained. At the elbow bulbar, at the humerus area, uh, triceps area prostatic and at the deltoid axillary area that would be um, bladder neck. All right so the main purpose of this case is to make a correct diagnosis and then plan surgical treatment. So maybe we could um, uh, Gaia switch up a little bit and get Alejandra in. Alejandra you you were the one that uh, taught me a very nice trick for figuring out whether to approach a rectum transabdominally or perineally. And when I say transabdominally, I mean either laparoscopically or laparotomy, obviously laparoscopically if you have those skills and equipment. And perineally, I would mean posterior sagittally. So this is a tricky one how would you figure out whether to approach this or how to approach this surgically? Well, um, in the lateral view, we can draw a, a line from the pubis to the coccyx, which is called the PC line. And you see um, what is the first structure you will find posterior sagittally when you open up from the coccyx, from the coccyx to deeper down. And if the first structure you find is the rectum, so the rectum is easily reachable from a posterior sagittal approach. If the first structure is the urinary tract, then you will need to do laparoscopy to detach the rectum from the urinary tract. So in this case, um, I can see the tip of the coccyx there. Yes, so it's a tricky one, um, but I think that it would be reachable from below. Um, mm. Mm, I don't know. It's a it's a tricky it's a tricky one. It's I, a tricky one. I put this case here because it's a tricky one. 
Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's called the pubococcygeal line. We consider naming it the Alejandra line, but uh, I think the PC line is maybe a name that would be more reproducible. Um, if you draw a line from the pubic bone to the coccyx, you get a good sense of where the rectum is. And maybe we can have Carlos a rec, uh, join us and for his assessment. And yes, so in this case, we have a very nice angle from the urethra and the fistula. It would almost look like 90 degrees and there seems to be some space between the rectum and the bladder. So this makes it a case that could be uh, reachable through laparoscopy. So I think that's would be a case that uh, where we can strongly consider doing laparoscopy first. Art, may I ask you this question? If you would do that uh, with a PSARP and not with laparoscopy, where would you look for the fistula if you in yeah, so, um, relation to the coccyx? So this is the this is the reason why I put this case is because it really shows a very important distinction between what can it be approached perineally and what can be approached laparoscopically. My personal assessment of this case is that because of where the fistula is located and it seems to be just at or above the urinary sphincter and therefore contrast quickly flows towards the bladder, we don't have the ideal representation of where is the true distal rectum. I don't know if you can see it, but there's sort of a flattening of the distal rectum. And I would bet that there is more rectum lower than that, that you just simply can't see when the contrast is filling. But true, true enough, um, as Alejandra has noted, the rectum is above the pubococcygeal line. However, I don't think approaching this posterior sagittally is the wrong answer. Um, laparoscopically is very elegant and maybe Martin, you can talk about some tricks relative to the point I'm about to make. The distal rectum, when it's nice and tapered, <clears throat> makes for a much easier laparoscopic case, but when it's very bulbous at the bottom, it's quite difficult. So that concerns me about this case. Now, in answer to your question, if I open posterior sagittally, I would look right under the coccyx, and I'm very confident that just under the coccyx, I would find the distal rectum. And I believe that this could be approached posterior sagittally. In fact, I probably would try it because I don't like the bulbous nature to the rectum. What are your thoughts about the laparoscopic version of this rectal dissection? Well, I think um, the, the, the key is to get good access to the fistula. So I, I hitch the posterior part of the bladder to the abdominal wall with a hit stitch. That's first of all. And then start very distally on the rectum not to compromise the blood supply after the pull, pull through. And you really, the, the fistula, the, 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 the rectum is like very wide and then suddenly it narrows down to get to the fistula. And you have to put almost a five millimeter, like a whack clip or something over it. Um, this has to be the diameter of the fistula until you divide it. If it's still too wide that you even need a stapler or something, you're not there. So you really have to get to the point where it's so narrow that you can place a clip over it almost. Uh, so these Thomas, are my points. Thomas, or, Thomas, do you have an opinion about uh, closing of the fistula, what material do you like to use? But I, I have also may, mainly used absorbable sutures. Can you give us your thoughts about uh, this? Yeah, I, I, I don't like to use the clip that stays down in the, in the pelvis. And um, I, I like to use a vessel loop with a three millimeter um, right angle or deep sector, you catch the fistula and actually, if you can catch it within, sorry, within a, a, a three millimeters, it's a reasonable three to five millimeters that a reasonable uh, um, small diameter to be the fistula. And, and once you hold it in the uh, this sector, you cut it and then put the vessel loop 
um, through the trocar in which you have cut the fistula and you close it over the dissector, uh, like for a, an appendicitis where you tie it around the, the, the loop. One, one very nice uh, trick that Keith Jorgensen taught me yeah. is to put the, um, the Maryland dissector on the fistula, but before you do that, preload it through the loop of the endoloop. Oh, so yeah. now it's, the endoloop is already ready to go. Then you put the uh, Maryland over the fistula and I agree with Martin. I like to make sure that a three millimeter instrument can completely close the fistula. Other, otherwise you should do a little bit more dissection until it's thinner. Then you cut and now over the vessel, over the Maryland, you put the vessel loop that you have already prepared. It's a very nice, uh, very nice trick. Carlos, do you have a, a comment about this technical point? Uh, not exactly about the technical point, but what I wanted to remark is uh, this is probably a high pressure distal colostogram. So even though it looks quite bulbous in this picture, I'm not sure once we look inside um, it's going to be that wide. And I agree with Martin. I would also put a stitch to uh, to the bladder to, to keep it away. And then you can easy, have an easier dissection plane to go down to the fistula. Okay, so let's uh, come to some conclusions here. Um, let's take a vote. Who would approach this case with laparoscopy? Everyone is... So Martin, you would do laparoscopy? Yes. Okay, and, and uh, Carlos, laparoscopy? Yes, I would at least um, inspect and then probably try to do it laparoscopically. And uh, Thomas, you're on mute. I, I think I would, would, would go for a PSARP. PSARP, I'm gonna vote with Thomas. I would also go with a PSARP. Um, well, so we're two to two. Um, Alejandra? Yes, I wanted to say a little trick that I, that I sometimes do in this type of um, borderline cases. I put a Foley catheter into the mucus fistula before I start the PSAR, and I have I have some difficulties finding the rectum. I put some saline into the distal uh, rectum to blow a little bit the the rectum, and it it helps sometimes to help you find the rectum. I like that trick. That's a very nice trick. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, can you vote laparoscopic or PSAR? PSAR. Okay, so we're three to two. Uh, Paola? PSAR. Four to two. And Julia? PSAR as well. And Pim? Uh, I would do laparoscopy. And maybe if the dissection of the fistula is difficult, I would uh, turn the baby, flip the baby, and uh, do a piece out. So as you can see, um, we have eight um, people that do a lot of colorectal surgery on the line, and we have perfect consensus on what the plan should be. I hope <laughs> everyone is reassured how straightforward it is to do colorectal surgery. Um, no, I'm just kidding. And, and I can tell you, this is the beauty of the field, but also I think what frustrates people is everyone wants protocols about the things that they don't have a lot of experience with, but everyone has a different feeling and they bring their own experiences to each case. And you see here that you have eight very well thought out opinions, but they are somewhat different. But the truth of the matter is, if you dissect the fistula elegantly and don't injure it or don't cut it off too high, leaving behind a remnant of the original fistula, and you don't injure the urinary tract, and you mobilize the rectum satisfactorily so there's no tension, that is success. However you would like to achieve that, by all means, that's the way to go. So you have to just respect the principles. So maybe we could have Julia give a little summary of what we talked about, and we can then move on to the next case. Okay, sure. I will try and give a summary. So regarding the first part, which was uh, trying to interpret her at the high-pressure distal colostogram, 
So it's important to look at the sacrum and describe the sacrum, uh, describe the marker, and um, uh, look at how distended the bowel is, and uh, visualize obviously the fistula if there is one, and see the urinary tract. Um, it's um, it's sometimes well, like in this image, it's not very clear initially where it's the fistula, but uh, then um, to determine the position of the fistula, there are two things that need to be considered. One is the position of the fistula itself compared to the urethra. Uh, so comparing the urethra to a, an arm. And then the second thing is the how filled the bladder is basically, which gives a hint uh, of where the position, about the position of the fistula compared to the urinary sphincter. So if the bladder is seen easily, then it means that it's most likely a bladder neck fistula. If it's difficult to fill the bladder, then it's most likely a rectobulbar fistula. In this case, it was a prosthetic. And then the decision to approach it transabdominally or from the perineum, it, it really depends um, on um, also on the surgical skills, but to have a quick, um, it's a quick, quick trick you can draw a PC line again here and if the first structure you will find when you approach posterior sagittally at the level of the PC line is the rectum then you can approach posterior sagittally otherwise you should use a laparoscopy or laparotomy as a the, the, the other thing I, I also want to point out is the the score was actually five to three PC Sorry. versus laparoscopy but as is typical, maybe from a, a, a soccer or football analogy, I think Julia would have preferred a four to four, which is a tie. Italy gets more points for a tie, but a five to three is a win, right? Isn't that correct? You know, it's the wisdom of the crowd, right? Uh, yeah. So the, the one thing I do want to comment is that we didn't talk about and then we can finish this case, is on the distal colostrum, you can see that the original colostomy was done beautifully. It was done very high in the sigmoid, and there's plenty of distal bowel for the pull through. The most common mistake made at the initial colostomy is the choice of where to put the colostomy is done too distal. And in this kind of case, if that were to happen, at the time of the definitive repair, the surgeon really is potentially going to risk losing the rectum and then having be, to be forced to pull through the colostomy. So please be careful to make your colostomy in the proximal sigmoid so you have plenty of length for the ultimate pull through. Great, right. Mark. Other case, what is, what is your take on this one? Okay, so did, let's see if we learned anything. Well, I see um, a very nice uh, sacrum, very nice lateral image. There's, um, we're missing the uh, perineal marker. And I don't know how much distal colon there is, but this is a very bulbous distal rectum. So let's see what everyone would do. Um, well, I think it's important to notice that just because the fistula is at the bulbar level, and I picked this slide intentionally, the rectum is actually much higher. Um, so don't only look at the fistula, also look at the features of the distal rectum. So likewise, this is a very dilated rectum, in fact, more dilated than the other case, which makes laparoscopy that much more difficult. But once again, the rectum is quite high and certainly above the PC line. But I think this case is, well, I'm not gonna say, Let's see what, so Martin, you choose PSARP? Okay. Yeah, but it's oh. gonna be tough. It's gonna oh, be tough. tough. I, would, I would make sure I was present in the radiology suite when the radiologist did the distal cholesterol. So, but, okay. well, I'm torn between PSARP and laparoscopy. I'm not really. <laughs> okay, you, you, you can be torn, but the one thing about being a surgeon is you have to make a decision at some point. Thank you, sir. So um, okay. <laughs> let's, let's go with laparoscopy here because it's really very high. That's okay. my opinion. And by the way, for anyone watching this, um, once it's uh, posted to Facebook, I want you to commit 
to your decision before you hear what everyone else has to say, because that's the that's the fun part of medicine. All right, Thomas, Thomas, what would you decide? Well, I, I agree that the rectum is, is is quite high, but I when, first when I saw it, I, I thought that I would try to go for a PSARP anyway. But, okay. But I, it is high, I agree. Paula. So uh, if the the column is too short to reach that we don't know, and you think you would detach the colostomy anyway, then I would try laparoscopically to dissect it. But okay. if the column is long enough, I would I would go PSARP first. Okay, the colon is long enough. So you choose PSARP? Yes, still, yes. Okay, Julia. Um, I think I would I would go laparoscopy in this case. I think. Okay, yeah. um, Carlos. Laparoscopy for Carlos. Laparoscopy <laughs> for Carlos. All right. Do we? All right, Alejandra. I would do laparoscopy in this case. Uh, yeah, a uh, Pim. Hi, Pim. Hi. What's your? Finally, the, the system seems to be working. I, I would do laparosco laparoscopy also. Also. Okay, and I am going to choose PSARP, and the reason why I'm choosing PSARP is because I'm very nervous of dissecting this fistula with a very bulbous rectum in my way, and I think the fistula part is easiest through PSARP, and I believe that the rectum can be found, although I know it's going to be very high. So once again, we have consensus, but now it's the reverse, five to three but in the other direction. So all we can tell you is that it's not easy to make these decisions, but you need to go with what you feel you are most comfortable with, where your skill set lies, and there is no wrong answer here as long as you respect the principles that we've discussed. Okay, very nice. Yes. Um, I think that was a great uh, session. I really in, in, enjoyed it and also to having so many friends online at the same time. Uh, I did not expect it to be that long, but that tells me also how much lessons there are to learn and how much tips and tricks um, there are to share. Uh, I thank everybody for joining today and I hope the UPSA community or the Facebook community or, or whoever um, can watch this video finds this an interesting format, educational form format and um, I guess I hope we have a, a, a new session um, that that is as much fun as this one. Mark, you want to say yeah. something? So again, thank you all very much. It's always great to be together. Um, obviously, we want to be really together, but we need um, one of your brilliant scientists in one of your countries to create a vaccine, and then we can be together again. Um, we have a few more cases we'll do with another session. I think it's nice that each case is about 15 to 20 minutes, and that can be then posted individually. And I um, hope to see you again soon. Gaia will create a new invitation, um, and uh, we'll do this again.